Paul writes here to the Ephesians, and he says to them here in verse 14, he says, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that He would grant you, according to the riches of His glory, to be strengthened with might by His Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in the church by Jesus Christ throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Dearly Father, we thank you once again for Jesus Christ. Lord, we're grateful for this opportunity that we have once again to come and study your word. Lord, we pray that as we do this, as we continue this study by looking at Paul's prayers, that that, that the overall objective of us learning how to pray from learning how Paul prayed might be accomplished. That we can have understanding, that we can know what is God's heart for us. What is it that God wants for the saints? What is it that our Apostle, the Apostle Paul, prayed for on behalf of the churches and on behalf of the people that he ministered to? And we pray that we would have clarity on these things and that as we go through them, we would learn things not only about who we are in Christ, but how who we are in Christ affects how we pray, how we relate, how we deal with each other as members of the church, the body of Christ. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Now, if you look at this, this prayer like the one in chapter 1 of Ephesians, is very lengthy. Okay, they run, it's, It begins, you can make a case for a beginning there in verse 13, but for sure it begins in verse 14, and it runs the, the, the length of the rest of the chapter, beginning at verse 14 down through the end there in verse 21. And before you sort of tackle the prayer itself, you really need to remember the context that the prayer is in. Because if you go back to verse 8 of Ephesians chapter 3, He says here, Unto me who am less than the least of all saints is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hidden God, who created all things by Jesus Christ, to the intent that now, under the principalities and powers in the heavenly places, might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. It's fascinating to me that on the heels of Paul's probably most detailed passage and description of what the mystery is, elaborating on what the church, the body of Christ is, elaborating on what God's will is to have all men see the fellowship of the mystery, and how we, you and I as members of the church, the body of Christ, participate in that ministry in verse 10, he then goes into this lengthy prayer at the end of that chapter where he is praying, essentially a prayer again for the saints, on, behalf, on our behalf to God the Father. And look at what he says here. Um, look, look at verse 14 again. He says, for this cause. So, for all of the reasons that he's just gone over with you in verse 1 down through verse, you know, 14, verse 13, and probably even, if you could apply that even back to chapter 2 and so forth, he says, for this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So he is, again, for the cause, for the reasons that he has just given you, he is getting ready to offer up another prayer to the Father on our behalf. Okay. Now before we sort of get into the details of this prayer, I want to give you, again, sort of the big picture overview like we've done before. So if you look at the prayer and look at the overview of the prayer, the prayer contains, again, essentially four major parts. Okay. According... Uh, to the God, to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, okay, according to the God, the Father, the riches and glory, Paul prays that the Ephesians would be and have the following. Number one, he says, strengthen with might by His Spirit in the inner man. Look at verse um, verse 16. He says that He would grant you according to the riches of His glory to be strengthened with might by His Spirit in the inner man. That's the first petition. That's the first request on Paul that Paul makes on our behalf and the behalf of the Ephesians to be strengthened with might by His Spirit in the inner man. Second, if you read verse 17, he says that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. So he says, not only do I want you to be strengthened with might by my Spirit, by His Spirit in the inner man, second, the, the second thing that Paul prays is that Christ would dwell in their hearts by faith. Thirdly, he talks about them in verse 17, that ye being 
rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge. So that's the third thing. He wants them to know the depth, the height, the length, the width of, of what it means to have the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge. And fourth, he says there at the end of verse 19, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of who? So just like the last prayer we saw in chapter 1, there are essentially four things Paul's after here. And he prays this prayer and he offers it up to God the Father on their behalf. That they, number one, would be strengthened with might by a spirit in the inner man. That they, number two, that Christ would dwell in their hearts by faith. That three, they would understand the, the height, depth, width, and breadth of the love of Jesus Christ, um, which passeth knowledge. And fourth, that they would be filled with all the fullness of God. So there's essentially four things. Now, you say, well, that's great. What does all that stuff mean? Well, that's what we're going to go over here as we go through this particular prayer. Now, to do that, go back again to verse 14, if you would. And let's start looking at what exactly he prays here. So he says in verse 14, For this cause, (laughs) again, for the reasons he's already listed, I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, who is he praying to? He's praying to God the Father, right, of our Lord Jesus Christ. So the prayer is being addressed to the Father. It's very interesting. Hold your hand there quick and flip back to chapter 1. Flip back to chapter 1 of Ephesians and look at verse 17. Verse 17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of what? Glory. It's interesting that when Paul offers these two prayers... He specifically offers them and addresses them as things that God the Father, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, would want them to have and want them to understand. Okay? Now, back to chapter 3, verse 14. Now, for this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Now look at verse 16. That He would grant you, according to the riches of His glory... To be strengthened with might by His Spirit in the inner man. Now, is there something that Paul prays to God the Father that He would grant the Ephesians? Now, that's, that's interesting language because what I want you to do quick is compare that, flip back again to chapter 1, and look at the similarity again. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17 that the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and knowledge of Him. Do you, you, you notice there that in chapter 1 he says that the God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, would give unto you, but then in chapter 3, verse 16, he says that He would grant you. Do you know that that's the exact same expression, generally? To give unto them or to grant unto them is a different way of saying the same thing. The expression translated give unto you in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 17 is the same word that is translated in chapter 3 verse 16. Therefore, there are some additional things. He offered the prayer in chapter 1 and he says, I want God the Father to give you these things. Now in chapter 3, on the basis of what he's just said, he's saying, now I want Him to give unto you or grant unto you some additional things. So you really, in a, in a sense, could, could take both of these together if you really wanted to be technical about it because this one is sort of adding to what he already said in chapter 1 based on what he said in between the prayer in chapter 1, in between the end of that prayer now and the beginning of this prayer. So there's some additional things here that Paul wants God the Father to grant to the Ephesians and also to us as members of the church, the body of Christ. Now look at verse 16 again there. Chapter 3, verse 16. Well, that that He would grant unto you, notice, according to. Now again, fascinating. Is he Whatever He wants granted to us, is it going to be according to or in line with something? Now compare that again, go back to chapter 1 and look at verse... See, it's not bad when I've got you flipping one page, right? Ephesians chapter 1, verse um, verse, six, verse 17. 
that the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and knowledge of Him, the eyes of your understanding and be enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of His calling, and what the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of His power to us who believe according to the working of His law. So again, you see that He's saying, now go back to chapter 3 again, verse 16, He's saying that there's some additional things that He wants to have granted to the Ephesians by God the Father that He's adding to and that are going to be granted according to, then He says in verse 16, the riches of His glory. The riches of His glory. Now, this week when I was studying through this, I went into my computer program and I typed in the word riches. And I looked at all of the places where Paul talks about riches. And let, there's way more of them than we have time to look at here. But I want, you, I want to point out another, i got to do this, i got to point out another similarity. These things here that he's going to pray that would be granted to the Ephesians are going to be granted to them according to or in line with the riches of his what? Glory. Now, go back to chapter 1 again. Verse 17. That the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and knowledge of Him. Verse 18, the eyes of your understanding and being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of His calling. Notice, and what the riches of the glory of His inheritance in what? The saints. So the things that Paul, the additional things that Paul is going to pray in chapter 3, that they would be granted to the Ephesians, either going to be granted according to or in line with the riches of His glory. Just like it said there in chapter 1, that they, that they would be granted to Him um, uh, the riches of glory of His inheritance. So there's some things about the riches of His glory that, uh, that, that God extends through Jesus Christ to us that Paul wants us to understand. And when God is going to do these things on our behalf, Paul says that they're going to be in line with or according to the riches of His glory. Now, all through Paul's epistles, All through Paul's epistles, he talks about the riches of God. Now, I want to start by looking at a few here in Ephesians. Look at Ephesians chapter 1, look at verse 7. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. It says, "...in whom we have redemption through His blood..." Notice, "...the forgiveness of sins..." And here's the expression again, "...according to what?" "...the riches of His grace." Now, Redemption and forgiveness of sins, according to that verse, are given to the believer according to the riches of his what? Now, if you, if, if you view God, this is a kind of a crude illustration, I know, but if, if, if God is a banker, okay, does his grace account ever run out? No. He gives us redemption, he gives us forgiveness of sins, and he pays for that out of the riches of his what? Grace, the riches that were bought and paid for by His Son on the cross. Okay, So He can give us forgiveness of sins, and He can give us redemption and a right standing with God, and He can do it according to the riches of His what? Grace. Because Paul says in Romans, chapter, in Romans where sin did abound, grace did what? Much more about. So God is rich in grace. He can dispense out of His riches of grace to us, forgiveness of sins, and redemption. Now that's just one example. Let's look at a few more. Look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18. We we already looked at this one. But read it again. (coughs) To the the eyes of your understanding and being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of His calling. Again, and what is... Now notice the change. What is the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints? Verse 7 was talking about the riches of His grace. That verse was talking about the riches of His what? Glory. God is going to receive glory through His Son, Jesus Christ. And He has an inheritance through us, which we talked about two Sundays ago, how that verse is not talking there about our inheritance, it's talking about His inheritance. And what He inherits through His glory, through the riches of His glory. Now, a few more. 
Look at chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, look at verse 7. That in the ages to come, He might show, notice, the exceeding riches of His what? Grace. In His kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. God has been rich to us in His grace. He is always there giving more grace, more grace, more grace. Now, should grace be abused? No, that's not what we're saying, okay? But what we are saying is God has abounded toward us out of the riches of His grace. There's the riches of His glory, too, that He talks about. Look, is God also rich in glory? Has God the Father taken the Son in Ephesians chapter 1 and exalted Him far above all principality, might, dominion, every name that is named, so that throughout all the ages of eternity and all things, Christ would have the preeminence? Okay? Then He's magnified His name above what? Every name. And so you have the riches of His grace, and you also have the riches of His glory. Look at chapter 3 of Ephesians, verse 8. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 8. Unto me who am less than the least of all saints is this grace given. Notice that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable what? See, we, I, I read that verse when I was studying for this message and I said, wow. This understanding, this message, makes us rich in Christ. Because we understand the unsearchable riches of who? You cannot go back into the Old Testament and read out and search out and demonstrate the things that Paul is talking about here in Ephesians chapter 3, can you? Can you go in the Old Testament and read about the fact that God was going to form a new body of believers in Himself, in His Son, based on the fact that Christ died, shed His blood, and that He was going to take Jews and Gentiles and reconcile them both to God equally in the cross? Can you go back in the Old Testament and read that? No. So He talks about the unsearchable riches of Christ. He's rich in grace. He's rich in glory, and He's also, when we understand the revelation given to Paul, we also understand the unsearchable riches of Christ. Another one. Go to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4, verse 19. He says, But my God shall supply all your need according to, there it is again, the according to expression, His riches in glory by who? Jesus Christ. By Christ Jesus. So there are all of these ways that Paul says that God has richly abounded toward us on our behalf. He's abounded toward us in grace. He's abounded toward us in His glory. When the things that Paul's praying for here in in Ephesians chapter 3 are going to be granted, they're going to be granted according to the riches of His glory. In other words, does God want to do this stuff? Does He want to strengthen you with might by His Spirit in the inner man? Is that what He wants for you? The obvious answer is what? Yes. That's why when he, when Paul prays, he's saying, these things are going to be granted to you according to the riches of His glory. God cannot wait to give these things to us. Some of them we've already received, haven't we? We've already received the forgiveness. We've already seen the redemption. We've already received all those things. What he's talking about in Ephesians chapter 3 is us practically being able to be strengthened with might by His Spirit. Where? In our inner man. Now, a few more things here. Look at Colossians chapter 1, verse 27. Colossians chapter 1, verse 27. You remember over there in chapter 3 of Ephesians that he talked about the unsearchable riches of Christ. Well, look at what he says here. Colossians chapter 1, verse 27. He says, To whom God would make known, unto, would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is, notice, Christ is in you, the hope of glory. So, you also have what Paul calls here the riches of, his, the, riches of the glory of, this, of His mystery, of this mystery. 
The fact that God kept this secret. The fact that this is unsearchable. And when you understand that, you understand the riches of the mystery. You understand all that God had in His Word for you to understand. Colossians chapter 2, look at verse 2. <coughs> that your hearts may be comforted being knit, knit together in love. Notice, unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding. How do you receive the full assurance of understanding? To the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of who? Christ. Now, go if you would to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. I hope that you understand this morning, when you walk out that door, that you're rich in Jesus Christ. That God has abounded toward you out of the riches of His grace. That out of the riches of His glory, Paul is petitioning the Father to grant us some things. To give them to Him. And because the, the price has been paid, because our sin account has been satisfied in Jesus Christ, He is waiting, willing, and excited for us to give us these things. To grant them to us. To see us function in them. To see us operate in them. To see us demonstrate what the life of Christ would look like as, it's, as we live and walk in them. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Look at verse 9. It says, For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice, that though He was what? Where was Jesus Christ before He became incarnate? He was in the heaven with the Father, wasn't He? Was He rich? Notice what it says. Though He was rich, yet for your sakes He became what? Poor. Does, does Paul talk in Philippians about how he made himself of no uh, reputation and took upon himself the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of what? Man. And that in that condition, in that condition of being in the form of a servant and the likeness of man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of what? The cross. So he was rich. But for our sakes, he made himself what? Poor. Now how's the verse end? Verse 9, that ye through his poverty might be what? Rich. Is that talking about the size of your bank account? Is that talking about the size of your 401k? No, that is talking about the richness that God has for us that he's already given to us in Jesus Christ. And it's out of those riches that he, that have already been secured that Paul prays we would be granted some things according to those riches. According to the fact that Christ became poor and through His poverty we could become what? Rich. Not monetarily rich. Not physically wealthy. But spiritually rich and abounded toward in Jesus Christ. Now I'll tell you what. I'd rather have that, because that can't, I can't lose that. Even the richest guy in the world, when he dies, can he take it with him? No. If you have these kind of riches, are they secured on your behalf and abounded toward you for all eternity? Okay, now. So what, you, you think about this, and you say, well... What's the definition of grace? Grace is God's riches. God's riches given and abounded toward us at whose expense? Christ paid the price. He paid the expense. He was the Redeemer. He was the one that went and died to secure the riches that we have in Jesus Christ. So when we think about grace, we're talking about uh, it's God's riches. The things that God is willing, ready, and able to, and already has, abounded toward us in because of what His Son accomplished. And so when Paul is praying, go back to Ephesians chapter 3, when Paul is praying this and asking God the Father to grant the Ephesians, and therefore us, some things, he says that they're going to be granted according to or out of the riches of this glory. That is, that He's ready to demonstrate to us on our account because of what Christ has already done 
on our behalf. And the fact that we are where? In Christ. Now, what exactly does he want granted to them? Verse 16. That he would grant unto you according to the riches of his glory, notice, to be what? Strengthened with might. With, uh, with might. Now, strengthened. The word strengthened means to be made strong. To increase in strength. Okay? So we, we, um, we talk about this, and I put it this way, might mean power. Okay? Now, to be strengthened means to be made strong, to increase in strength, to grow strong. Uh, I, for those of you who don't know this, next, this, this fall I'm going to be uh, working with the freshman football team. And so after school, I'm in there, and um, they're lifting weights, and I'm lifting weights with them. And why are they lifting weights? To get what? To get stronger, right? So that they can perform better on the field, so that they can play better, and all these types of things, right? You understand the concept of being strengthened. The strength that Paul is talking about is not that, it's not, you know, a physical strength. It's going to be a spiritual strength. Look at what it says. Strengthened with, strengthened with what? Look at the verse. Strengthened with might. Okay? Now, this strengthening is going to be with might. Okay? So what is might? Well, notice that we are to... We are to boy, there are typos in this. Who made this? <laughs> Who made this? That was me. To be strengthened with might, might literally means power. And I want you to look at these verses with me. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. I see everybody saying, man, that guy can't spell. I can't, so you're right. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. Hopefully you'll be gracious with me. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, it says, And he said unto me, My grace, is sufficient for thee. Notice, for my what? My strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities. Notice that the what? The power of Christ may rest upon me. There's a reason why I chose that verse. Because you see at the beginning of that verse, he talks about my strength. You see that? And then at the end of the verse, he talks about that the power of Christ you see the word strength and power are the same word that's translated might in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 16. So if you're going to be strengthened by might, literally the Scriptures are teaching that you will be strengthened with power or might because that's what might means. It means power. Go to Ephesians chapter 1, look at verse 19. How many of you have picked up on the fact that there are massive similarities between the prayer in Ephesians 1 and the prayer in Ephesians 3? And that's why I told you at the beginning that I sort of view these as a continuation. Okay, uh, they're, they're both asking God the Father. The first one says to give unto you. The second one says to grant unto you. And they're both going to be according to some things. They both have to do with the, the riches of His glory. They both have to do with what God wants to accomplish. And they both also have to do with might and power demonstrated toward the believer. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 19. And what is the exceeding greatness of His what? Power to us word who believe. According to the working of His, what kind of power is it? Mighty power. What did He say He wanted you to be strengthened with? Strengthened with what? Might. With power. He already, he already prayed over here that, that you would understand the exceeding greatness of His power, and that that would be manifested on your account and toward you, and it's the same power that He used to raise Christ up from what? From the dead. He also says, "Go to look at Colossians chapter 1. We'll go over to Colossians chapter 1. Verse 11. There's this prayer. We'll get to this prayer in a few weeks. But this is also a prayer. He says here in verse 11, 
that ye may, verse, verse 10, that ye might walk worthy of the Lord on all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Strengthened with all what? Might. There it is again. See, you are going to be, if you're going to be strengthened, you're going to be strengthened with God's might or God's power. That's why he told you in, in Ephesians chapter 1, in the first prayer we looked at, that you need to understand the exceeding greatness of His power toward us, word who what? Believe. Because it's not, if you are going to do anything in this life for God, it's going to be His power working through you. Because if it's not His power and His life being made manifest in you, then it's just you doing some stuff. It's just you doing it of your own strength, your own ability, your own accord, but it's not Him doing it through you. Okay? It has to, that's why he, Paul is praying these things on our behalf. Go back to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. Now, notice what else it says. See, you just read this verse and read it. Oh, that's a nice verse, and I'm spending a whole hour talking about it. Verse 16, that He would grant you according to the riches of, the, riches of His glory to be strengthened with might. Okay, how? How are you going to be strengthened with might? What's the next three words? By His what? Spirit. There it is. Can you do this on your own? Can you live in the strength, the power, and might of the Father that He's exceedingly abounded to you in, in chapter 1? The same power that He used to raise up Christ from the dead. Can you do this on your own? Now, have you noticed here how this prayer seems to be picking up right where the one in chapter 1 left off? Because the last thing He talked about in chapter 1 was the issue of understanding the exceedingly abundant power toward us who believe. What's the first thing He talks about in this prayer? The first thing He wants God to grant you, according to the riches of His glory, is to be strengthened with might by His what? Spirit. Spirit. You can't do this. I can't do this. None of us can do this on our own. So, you ask the question, how are we going to receive this strengthening with might? It's going to come by the Spirit. And it's only going to be the work of the Holy Spirit that produces and furnishes us with this strength. Now, it's fascinating because during the dispensation of grace, God empowers and energizes His church through the work of His Holy Spirit, the third member of the Godhead. Go with me and look at these verses. Go to Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15. Now, you look at Paul... Did Paul literally travel the world preaching the gospel? When Paul traveled the world, he preached the gospel, and he, he, he did basically he did three things. He preached the gospel, established some believers. He took those believers and he established a church. And once the church was established, he turned that church over to local leadership, and then he went on to the next place. Okay? And if you look at Romans chapter 15, verse... <clears throat> Well, for the sake of time, look at verse 13. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and, and peace in believing. Notice, that ye may abound in hope through what? The power of the Holy Ghost. Didn't we study something last time I was with you about understanding the hope of your calling? If we are going to abound in hope, that is not going to come to us by watching the news and all that sort of thing, is it? If we are going to focus on our hope, if we are, if we are going to wait for that blessed hope and look for it with anticipation, it's going to be the work of the Spirit in us that causes us to fixate and, and appreciate and dwell on what our hope actually is. Because in the earthly existence that we live in, everything is pulling our focus off of the heavenlies and down where? Down here. Right? Where is our conversation? It's in heaven. Where is our citizenship? It's in heaven. 
All of those things are heavenly. And Paul is constantly looking the believer up to the heavens where we're seated with Christ, where we're sealed, and all these different things in the heavens. But our life here on earth is always causing us to focus where? What's here? Same chapter, look at verse 19. It says, through mighty signs and wonders. Notice, by the power of the Spirit of who? God. So that from Jerusalem and round about unto Iliacrum, I have fully preached the gospel of who? Now when Paul says, hey, does, does Paul say this? Hey guys, look at what I did. Or does he say, hey, from Jerusalem to Iliacrum, the gospel is preached. But whose power was it that was doing it? The power of the Spirit of who? Of God. Paul does not take the credit. He gives the credit to where the credit is due. The fact that the Spirit was doing what? Working in him. Look at another one. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Verse 4. I feel like this. I feel like this a lot, especially when I've got typos in my PowerPoint. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom. <laughs> As if it were, everything would be spelled right, right? Okay. Anyway, so he says here, and my and my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom. Notice, but in the demonstration of the Spirit. Notice, and of what power? When Paul preached. It was the Spirit speaking through Paul. And I don't mean some hocus-pocus kind of thing, like you hear people talk about, oh, the Lord just told me that you need to give me 1995. I'm not talking about that kind of stuff. I'm talking about the power of God's written Word, God's Word to Paul, Paul going out there and doing what? Preaching it. Doesn't he say in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, for I'm not ashamed of what? The Gospel of Christ. Why? For it is the power of God unto what? salvation. You talk about the power of God. The message and the power the power of God is in the message. Because when people hear and believe the message, the message has the power to pass them from death to what? Life. When they believe it. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. One more on this. We'll skip the one in, in Timothy. Just for the sake of time. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. You can, you can look that one up on your own time if you desire. It's talking about how we've not been given the, the spirit of fear but a power and love and of a sound mind. And the reason I didn't turn there is because I'm, you know, you, you're familiar with that verse and we've talked about it a lot. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7. I'm, I'm sorry, verse 5. For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in what? In power and in the Holy Ghost. Have you noticed that in all of these verses, when it talks about power, who's also mentioned in relationship to the power? The Holy Spirit. So when go back to Ephesians chapter 3, when Paul prays that to God the Father, and he petitions God the Father on the behalf of the Ephesians and also on our behalf, that we would be granted, what is it that he wants us to be granted? He wants us to be granted according to the riches of His glory, to be strengthened with might by His what? Spirit. So, any power that we receive that manifests itself through us, is it our power or is it His power through the Holy Spirit? That's the point. Okay? Strengthened with might by His Spirit. Now, here is the big point. Where? Where are you going to be strengthened with might by His Spirit? Where? It says, in your inner what? Man. Now that is, to me, of everything in this verse, this is the most important part of the verse. He says here, that this strengthening with might by the Spirit is going to occur where? In our inward man or our outward man? In our inner man. In our inner man. In, in the inner part of us, 
as believers. How are we going to be strengthened with His might? We're going to be strengthened with might by His Spirit. The place that we're going to be strengthened with this might and this empowering, this uh, strengthening is going to occur by His Spirit, but the place that it's going to occur is going to be in your inner man. Now, all that being said, apparently this is in here twice, threefold nature of man. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Now, do you hear, do you or do you not hear a lot of prayers that are being offered asking God to do stuff? Lord, heal this person. Lord, fix the car. Lord, give me a job. Lord, please make sure that this bill gets passed. Lord, please make sure that this person gets elected. Lord, please make sure that, please, please impress upon so and so that, that they need to do this, that, or the other thing. Lord, please show me who I'm supposed to marry. Please do all of these different things, right? Now, all that stuff, is that inner man stuff or is that outer man stuff? That's all outer man stuff, isn't it? That is not inner man stuff. Most of the stuff that we pray for, and don't misunderstand me because I've already told you that every subject in your life is a subject that is a fair game for you to pray about, but most of the prayers, most of us traditionally view God as a vending machine. We go to the vending machine, okay, I'm putting the stuff in, okay, what do I want today? Okay, I want healing for so-and-so, okay, D3, boop, here out comes the healing. Right? Isn't that the way most of us view some of this stuff, or traditionally have viewed it? But when Paul prays here, his prayer is not for a strengthening in might so that you can go move mountains and, and, and do all this sort of thing. It's for your what? Inner man. Now, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, <coughs> 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16 says, For this cause we faint not, though our outward man what? Perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. I go to this verse to demonstrate something to you. Does the Scriptures teach that there's a difference between your outward man and your inward man? Okay? Your outward man is your body. It's the thing that you relate to the physical world around you, right? You can smell, you can taste, you can touch, you can hear. Okay? You have senses with which you interact with the physical world around you. That's your outward man, right? Go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 quick. We all understand that, right? You know that I've walked into the building because you've seen the physical shape that you associate with who? Brian. Okay? I know you've walked into the building because I've, we've identified people in a human sense by what they look like. Okay? By their, by, we know who each other is because we've associated a name with a figure, basically. Okay? A person. A body. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. It says here, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. Notice how holy is spelled there. It's not spelled H-O-L-Y. It's spelled A-W-H-O-L-L-Y. Talking about holy. Meaning a whole person. Okay? And I pray God that your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now I already have this up here, but which one of those three things is your outward man? It's your body. Okay? You and I relate to each other. We know we, we respond to each other on the basis of our senses and our uh, on these sorts of things. But here's the kicker. You and I, we are not our bodies. The thing that makes Brian Brian is not this body, it's the inner man within this body. Paul talks about how this body is just a tent that we live in for a while. And when the earthly tent of this tabernacle is, 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 is dissolved, we have a tabernacle made without hands where? In the heavens. So we have an inward man, we have an outward man, our body, but we also have an inward man. And our inward man is our soul and our spirit. Now, do we, if you believe that verse, do you have a soul and spirit? Can you see it? No. What can you see? The outward man, right? Now, where are we strengthened? With, where is Paul praying that we would be strengthened with might? 
In our inward man. So the inward man then has to be referring to our soul and our what? Spirit. Now, that being said, when you get saved, well, let me say it this way. The natural man, Paul talks about, who is by nature a child of wrath in Ephesians chapter 2, do, do the lost have a body, a soul, and a spirit? Yes. But their spirit is dead to the life of who? To the life of God. They still have a body and a soul and a spirit. And it's those mechanics that make it possible for if somebody who dies without Christ, their soul and their spirit are still going to exist and live on and survive the death of their body, but they will go where? To hell, ultimately the lake of fire. Whereas the believer, when we get saved, our spirit is regenerated and who comes and, and sets up shop and residency and dwells and lives in our spirit. God's spirit. So if we're going to be strengthened with might by His spirit, it's going to occur where? In our inward man. Listen. Essence communicates with essence. You have a spirit, God has a what? Spirit. And when you get saved, His Spirit comes to live where? In your spirit. And, it's, and there is where you commune with God. He, who wrote this book? All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, right? Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Right? So you have a spirit. When you get saved, God's spirit comes and baptizes you into the body of Christ, seals you into the body of Christ, and lives and dwells in your spirit. Now can you commune with God? That's why Paul says, The natural man receives not the things of the spirit of who? Neither can he know them because they are spiritually what? Discerned. They've got a dead spirit. Here's the spirit of God over here, and they cannot do what? Commune. But when the gospel is believed, the Holy Spirit comes and lives where? In your spirit. Now can you be strengthened with might by a spirit where? In the inner man. Now, <coughs> all that being said, make sure I'm not getting ahead of myself here. Go back to Ephesians chapter 3 real quick. Because I want to show something to you. Notice in verse 14 again. For this cause I bow my knee unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who is Paul praying to? The Father. Right? Go down to verse... Notice also that Christ is mentioned. The Father of who? Our Lord Jesus Christ. So you've got God the Father that the prayer is being offered. It's being offered to God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Then you look at verse 16, that He would grant you according to the riches of His glory to be strengthened with might by His what? Spirit. So notice that in verse 14, Paul prays to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So he prays to God the Father that in verse 16, the Spirit would strengthen us with might in our what? So you've got Paul addressing one member of the Godhead and asking another member of the Godhead to do something on behalf of us, specifically to strengthen, with, to strengthen us with might by a spirit in our what? Inner man. Now, it's imperative that you understand that this mighty strengthening is going to occur in your inner man today. This is, I cannot stress this enough. Today, in the dispensation of grace, God is doing something different than He was in the past. He has concluded Israel, His physical, earthly people, in unbelief, and is forming the church, the body of Christ. A new, spiritual, heavenly agency. Therefore, God deals with His body, the body of Christ, differently from how He dealt with Israel in time past. Just think about it for a minute. What did God promise Israel? 
A land, right? A seed. Is a land physical? There it is, land. Go walk in it, he tells Abraham. Right? Walk in it. See the way, the, 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 the width, the height, the breadth. Go walk around in it, Abraham. It's yours. Does he promise him a seed? Is that physical? Does he promise him a king on a throne, in the land, reigning and ruling over the nation? All of those things are what? Physical. What has he given the body of Christ? Go to Ephesians chapter 1. Look at verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed us with all physical blessings in earthly places. Is that what it said? Then can somebody please tell me why that is the focus of the majority of the preaching that is being preached today in this country? How many churches today are telling their people that God wants you to be rich? How many churches are telling their people today that if you're not rich, you're out of the will of God? What does that verse say? That verse says that we have been given all, what kind of blessings? Spiritual blessings. And all the spiritual blessings that we have been given have been given to us where? In the heavenly what? Places in Jesus Christ. So when we talk about being strengthened with might by the Spirit in the inner man, what we are talking about is a fundamental distinction of how God is going to work today in the world. Somebody says, well, Brian, if I can't... Here's the one I like. Lord, give me a job. You can pray for a job till the cows come home, and if you don't get off your butt and look for one, God's not going to supernaturally deposit a job in your lap. Right? So you go out and you look for a job, and then you end up finally finding a job, and then, oh, God bless me with what? A job. Now look, I'm not... God, does God want you to work? If a man doesn't work, he shouldn't what? Eat. But is God manipulating the minds of lost people to give you a job. What is he doing? So somebody says, well, what you're saying then, if God's not keeping my car on the road on the way home and keeping the spark plugs in the distributor cap and doing all these things physically, what you're saying is God just doesn't care about me. He's not working in my life. Am I saying that? I'm not saying that. And if that's what you think I'm saying, then you haven't listened to everything that we have to say. Because God is at work. If God is not at work, then Paul would not pray for us to be strengthened with might by His Spirit. Where? The key is understanding where and how is God working. Because He is still working. But He's also not working the same way He was for Israel. Because the body of Christ is not a physical earthly entity. We are a spiritual heavenly entity. Go, to, go, if you would, to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Let me demonstrate it to you. Look, I know, I know folks who are so mad and frustrated with God because He's not doing this stuff for them. Because they haven't understood that they're not Israel. Listen, in the law... When Israel saw no rain, did they know what the rain meant? It meant what? We, we're, we're being blessed. How do we know? Because they saw the rain or because God's Word told them what the rain meant? God's Word told them what the rain meant. The flip side, when they don't see any rain and there's drought and famine, do they sit there and scratch their head? Hmm, I wonder what God's trying to tell us. No, they went to the law and said, oh, well, one of the curses that's going to come upon us if we break the law is that it's not going to work. So if I pray and confess my sin and the nation does this, will God send the rain? Yeah, but you're not under the law, are you? You need to keep that in mind when you think about how God is working. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16. Notice, wherefore... 
Henceforth. What does the word henceforth mean? It means from now on. Notice. Wherefore, henceforth, from now on, know we no man after what? Say, what's he talking about? You just said that that's how we identify people. Yeah, that's how we identify people in a physical sense, but that's not what he's talking about here. He says, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, notice, yet now, what's the next word? Henceforth, know we him what? So, did Israel have a physical relationship with Jesus? Did He come to them? Did He walk amongst them? Did He teach them in the flesh? Did He do signs, wonders, and miracles demonstrating that the kingdom of God had come unto them and all those things? But where is God today? Where is Christ today? He has ascended and sitting at the right hand of God the Father and has demonstrated to us through the ministry of the Apostle Paul what He is doing today. He is not doing those things anymore today. But what He is doing is He's forming a spiritual body of believers in His Son. So when He's going to work with that spiritual body, He's going to work with, in, and through them in accordance with the nature of that body. Israel was a physical nation. The body of Christ is a spiritual, new creature, new creation, he says. Look at verse 17. Therefore, for man, beware. In Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become one. New. Now, so as a result of all of that, go to Ephesians chapter 4. I'm sorry, Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4, verse 19. He says, My little children, of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed. Where? 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 Where is He at work? In your inner man. In you. Notice, so that Christ can be formed where? Where? In you. Let me explain that in a second. Go to another verse. Go to Colossians chapter 1. A couple verses will take me to get to, to, to impress this upon you. Galatians, I'm sorry, Colossians chapter 1. Look at verse 27. Colossians chapter 1. We read this verse earlier. Colossians chapter 1, verse 27. To, to whom God would make known would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. Notice, what is the riches of the glory of the mystery among the Gentiles? Which is Christ where? In you, the hope of what? God, Jesus Christ, God the Father through His Son, wants to make His Son's life manifest where? In you. Look at one more on this. 2 Corinthians. Chapter 4. Go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. See, God did not just save you from hell so that you could go live however you wanted. He saved you from hell and He made you a part of His body and He gave you all spiritual blessings and He abounded toward you in wisdom and prudence and, and all of those things and gave you an inheritance and, and sealed you and seated you in His Son and all these sorts of things. So that, because His desire, the burning heart of His desire, is that Christ's life would be made manifest where? In you. And the the work, the, the strengthening with might by the Spirit in the inner man is designed so that the life of Christ can be made manifest. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse, um, verse 10. Always Bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus. Notice that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest where? In our body. What is that verse saying? That verse is saying that it is God's desire for Christ to walk around in you. For Christ to walk around where? In you. Look at the next verse. For we which are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, 
Notice that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest where? In our mortal one. See, what's he saying? You know what religion wants to do? Religion comes and it wants to stamp everybody and make you all the same. You can't do this, you can't do that, you're supposed to do this, you're supposed to do that, and make everybody everybody all the same. You know what Christ really wants to do? He wants to live His life out through who? You and me. So the the question is not, is everybody like Brian? Because please, we don't want that, trust me. But the question is, what would Christ be like, look like, talk like, act like, if He were Enos? If He were Craig? If He were Daryl? If He were Bill? If He were Ernie? If He were Becky? What would Christ, what would Christ's life manifest look like if it was being made manifest in us? Because that is what all of this stuff is designed for. For us as individual saints, with our own personalities, our own talents, our own strengths, our own weaknesses, to demonstrate the life of Christ manifest in our one. That does not mean everybody is going to look, act the same. It means everybody is going, every member of the body of Christ is going to be, when Christ is formed in us, He's going to be Christ here, Christ here, Christ there, but it's all going to be whose life? It's all going to be Christ's life flowing out through each and every one of us as individuals. The issue is not everybody being like... Isn't that what most of our views of Christian, the Christian life are like? We have this one standard and we say this is what it should be. And there is only one standard of the life of Christ. My point to you is when Christ's life is lived out through you as an individual, it's going to look the same, it's going to have the same attributes the same general principles and stuff like that, but I'm not you, and so Christ made manifest in me is not going to look the same as Christ manifest where? In you. Go two more verses and we'll quit. Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, verse 13. Philippians chapter 2, verse 13. It says, For it is God which worketh... Where? Where? Is God at work today? Yes, He is at work today. Where is He at work today? In you, in your inner man. Both to will and to do of His good what? See, what you have is you have the body of Christ at large that are running like fools after Israel's signs. That's what they're doing. And they're not understanding that God is doing and desiring to do something where? In them. And not only that, He wants to do it in you and He needs you to accomplish His purpose. We saw that last Sunday. Or two weeks ago. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. So let's talk for a second about some practical application here. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. I'm just going to put all this up here so it's there. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 13, it's Paul says here. He says, "But but we are bound to give thanks." That's not the right one. I'm in 2 Thessalonians. Sorry, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. For this cause also, thank we God without ceasing. Because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, notice, ye received it not as the word of who? So when the Thessalonians received the words that Paul was telling them, They did not receive them as His words or the words of men, but they identified and received them as the words of who? God. You received it not as the word of men, notice, but as it is in truth, the word of who? Look at the last phrase. Which effectually worketh also where? Where? In you that what? Where is God at work today? In you. How is He working? 
He's working in you that what? Believe. Believe what? That this is not the words of men, but the Word of what? God. And that when you believe this, this will effectually worketh also in you that what? See, I know what happens. You, you, go, you go to Grace Church for a while and you, you, you get some edification, you get some doctrine in you, and you go out and you say, this, this stuff ain't working. It ain't working. It's broken. It's not any different than anything else. What is the key to that verse? It only works when you what? What is it that activates the power of the Word of God in your life? It's you believing it. So when you're standing there in front of that loved one that's dying, and you say, where's grace now? Where's the grace life now? Where is all this stuff now when I need it? When I've lost my job? When my wife has cancer? When the kids are going off into all this stuff that they shouldn't be into? Where is this now? Well, it's still where it always has been. The question and the issue that we have to do is we have to make a conscious faith decision to apply it to our life. And when we do that, will it work? See, we have to operate in faith, don't we? And I'm not talking about all this goofy stuff about stepping out in faith and blah, blah, blah. I'm, I'm talking about faith in the words on the page applied to the details of your life because when you do that, this Word will work effectually in you that do what? So when it looks bleak, when it looks dark, when it looks like there's no hope, that's when you've got to take the dare of faith and decide... Despite what I see, despite what I feel, despite what my friends, my family, the friends of Job, if you will, are telling me, I'm going to make a choice to do what? Believe what God said. Who wrote this book? God the Holy Spirit. Paul said that we should be strengthened with might by His what? Spirit in our where? Because when you take the word that the Spirit wrote... And you by faith believe it and you stand in it and you say, I'm going, to believe, I'm going to act in this, not my old man, not my old nature, not my human viewpoint. You will be unleashing the might, the power of God to work what? Effectually in you that one. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for Jesus Christ. Lord, we're grateful for the, the opportunity that we've had to come out and study your word. And Lord, we pray that as we study these prayers, I, I, I continue to come back to this in my own mind. When was the last time I prayed this prayer for my wife, for my family, for the church, for the saints, for the people that matter the most to me in my life? And as we think about prayer, and as we think about how we so often feel like we don't know what to pray for, that we can take these prayers, that we can pray that we would understand the hope of our calling, that we would understand the glory of His inheritance in the saints, that we would understand the exceeding greatness of His power to us who believe, that we may know Christ, and that we can be strengthened with might by a Spirit in the inner man. And as we only have covered one verse of the whole prayer, that as we come back to this next Sunday and we finish this up and look at the rest of it, that we can have clarity and we can begin to pray with understanding knowing what the things are that you want for us. Lord, we pray that the saints would be edified for having come out. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.